Everybody look out the window until he calls us, right? Okay. Wake up, wake up! We had to shoot the Brazilian video, and then we had to shoot Joaquin watching the Brazilian video to make one scene, so we, there was actually two separate scenes there. And the Brazilian video, I knew I wanted it all one shot, so it would look authentic, no cuts and stuff like that. Handheld, and Joaquin just kind of watching from his closet. And now you see it for the first time, but you don't really see it. Move, children! Vamanos! I'm so glad it came out the way I had hoped it would, you know, with the electricity of the kids screaming. And I remember when we did Joaquin's side of it, he was doing these amazing reactions here. And then I said, you know, in the last one, I said, end up in the, end up in the coats. And he's like, what? And I said, Just, I, 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 want your, I want you to be in the coats at the end. And he backed up and backed up into the coats. And then he watched and goes, huh? And, you know, and then grabbed the chair and came forward and all. And I was like, that is definitely in the movie. And when we finished, I was like, check the gate. That's definitely in the movie. This is the most committed actor I've ever run into. And for me, that was a complete joy. Because of his commitment, all our discussions were positive and creative of how do we do this better? How do we strip away any baloney and make this absolutely real? When I first met Joaquin and we went to the firehouse for the first time, he was so terrified of heights, he couldn't even go down the fire pole. He's down, Jack. He's leaning off the side of a 15-story building. That's him. There's no visual effect. That's him in the movie dangling from a rope going over the side of a 15-story building. I met Johnny Cash writing the script for Walk the Line. The biggest thing John was worried about, John Cash was worried about, is he was like, don't let these actors hold a guitar like it's a baby. And so he would go, John Cash grabbed his guitar by the neck and stay there, and he like walked away with it dragging behind him, you know, uh, like... Uh, um, because for him, he said, you know, a guitar is a tool to a musician. To people who idolize musicians, a guitar is like, oh my God, I'm holding Johnny Cash's guitar. But to Johnny Cash, it's just like holding a plunger or a, a toilet bowl brush or a broom. You know, it's just what he makes music with. So I told, I shared that story with Joaquin, and he tried to live with a guitar. I got stuff. Brilliant actor, Joaquin, one of the great instinctual actors I've ever come across. It's like his system will shut down if he doesn't feel the scene is true. I have a lot of love for Joaquin Phoenix. Obviously, I've made like 200 movies with him. Part of what makes him magnificent, that sensitivity and the intelligence that I love when I talk to him, he brings it with him in the work. That struggle against the darker side is abundantly clear on the screen. I've talked about him comparing him to Montgomery Clift, who was another actor I really loved, who always seemed to be tormented, and Marlon Brando, of course. But I do think he's in their class. I think he is capable of just the most vivid depiction of our, our internal conflict. But he's a bit of an enigma, I think, to audiences. And yeah. because he, he, he kind of, we don't know that much about him. He's not one of those actors who plays the celebrity role well at all. He's, he's committed to his craft. Um, having worked with him as long as you have, who is he? Well, uh, I, I think uh, Joaquin is a bit of a throwback, uh, not to the actors of the 30s, but if you look at the history of uh, the cinema, American cinema particularly, um, it's interesting how the style or the form of the cinema is in part informed by the evolution of acting in the cinema. It's not really a director-driven evolution. In other words, when you had filmic representational acting, which is what you know, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman are doing and mm -hmm. doing brilliantly well, these are some of my favorite movies ever, mm -hmm. but there is an artificiality to it. Sure. Uh, and when they were shooting those films, you know, for example, Notorious, I was talking about this just the other night, maybe it was last night, where Hitchcock could storyboard every shot of the movie and the cinematographer could put marks on the floor and Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman no doubt would hit the marks and they could do, have a driving scene with a fake background and everyone would buy it. And it oh, you wouldn't buy it, but you'd accept it, fine, that's it's what a movies convention. have. It's yeah. a convention, they have that, fine, you deal with it. And then... Uh, I will answer your question about Joaquin, but it, it, it needs this pre, you know, peroration. 
the, the, uh, the thing about the method, which gets a, a kind of bad rap, but I think is really the best thing that ever happened to the movies in many respects, is the director started to have to understand that the actor could surprise him or her, mm -hmm. that the actor could do things that were totally, not only unexpected, but were technically wrong or would screw up the technicians or whatever. It was a bit of a problem. That is what the new Hollywood brings, right? Then look what's happening now. Now with movies, no more method acting. Now it's filmic representational again in its own way. And look at the music. Now there's a hundred minutes of music in movies, generally routinely. They score everything like cartoons again. Mm -hmm. So in some way the movies have regressed. And I'm insulting old movies, which I love maybe more than the new Hollywood. But I'm saying in terms of style. Now Joaquin is from that period of the method. Now if I called him a method actor to his face, he'd want to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, he is an explosive totally unpredictable presence on set in the best sense. You know the cliche of uh, Diaghilev's quote, étonnez-moi, surprise yeah. me. It often leads to you know, shots that are cut into the movie that are slightly out of focus or not framed perfectly or whatever, but you live for it because it's the explosiveness and the unpredictability of, of authenticity, hmm. not reality, because that's not what we're going for, but, but authenticity. authenticity. Yeah. And I forged a very close relationship with him after the yards because I, I recognized that he really was into that sort of thing, and that was the kind of thing that made it worthwhile going to work in the morning. Now, you're sort of known, and maybe only to me because I'm a, a mm -hmm. dork and have listened to your DVD commentaries uh -oh. and so interviews with you, but you do impressions almost of all of your actors when you're telling stories about uh -huh. them. You have a Joaquin impression. Which is, no, which he, by the way, he hates that. He says it's not good. Can I hear it? Oh, James, James, what are you doing? I don't want to do that scene. <laughs> now, he hates it. But when I do it for anybody else, they have that reaction. They laugh. I'd always wanted to work with Joaquin. I've tried to work with him before, and it never worked out. And this was just a kind of, this was the opportunity that came up, and the time was right, and the character was right. And I certainly never thought I'd look at Joaquin standing like that. That, that, like I said before, you know, that was never in my mind's eye. That's such a predominant part of the film, you know. I wrote, the, the, the first scene of the movie was written as like exterior beach Guam, you know, Freddie Quell is on the beach after VJ Day. That's all I wrote because we just wanted to go to a beach and start doing things. Joaquin let me know that he actually his shoulder is kind of a been a bit of, I think a, from birth he's got a kind of a messy shoulder and, and he's probably spent a lot of time trying to hide it or stand up straight so that if he kind of kind of twist his body around and he sort of said do you think it'd be all right if I do this and I said sure great and but a couple days into the film he just sort of was feeling more comfortable and just kept sliding into the skin that he was doing that kind of this movements that were so incredible I didn't I just didn't want to jinx anything and say what are you doing or what's going on you know it's kind of you're in the middle of make-believe you don't want to break the spell you're just gonna to want to watch him do whatever he's doing and I mean, it's just this animal that's walked into where there's a bunch of movie cameras that happen to be on and it's the highest compliment of acting I mean it's it's it would be a mistake to think that he is not in complete command of himself and, and these ideas. He's a, a, an incredibly inventive actor and incredibly instinctual and unpredictable. But he's also very intelligent too. So usually those things don't don't mix together. You know, you usually don't get that combination. Sometimes you get an intelligent actors that are very cold and can't be instinctual. But Joaquin. I think enjoys flirting with danger, enjoys getting very close to dangerous situations. I mean, we were with Joaquin, your, yeah, your yeah, good, friend yeah, Joaquin. good friend Joaquin. Oh, I got to tell you, also, I, I got to thank you. You're a part of why we cast Joaquin, because when he was on your show apologizing for the monkey business time, <laughs> Goofball, yeah. he, he came on and I saw that clip and I just, I, he was very, I didn't know if he'd be right for the role and he, on your, your show. He's very good in this. And on, this. You, you cast him for I don't know, for me, I just kind of feel like I telepathically willed him into the film or something, because to me, it was like, it was the first time I'd ever went, I mean, I normally I'll write the character a bit more and I'll kind of find it, and, and this was the first time where I was like, it's got to be him, like, and 
here he is and here's a picture stuck in my computer and you know he's going to be in this movie and whenever anyone asks me any producers or whatever who do you want to cast I'd be working Phoenix and then they'd ask me again I'd go working Phoenix and working Phoenix like and then I figured out it's like oh god it's because he doesn't do any press like <laughs> 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 maybe they want someone that does press but I, I, for me it was always a no-brainer but it was a bit yeah like I, I don't know I kind of He's really choosy, so he could have easily said no, but just somehow I, I, I didn't. I thought it would work. I, I, I don't know. I didn't think about it. I just knew it was him, you know. And it sounds like I mean, you had an incredible experience. Yeah. I know. I know you've obviously you've referred to him as your sort of cinematic soulmate. And <laughs> I mean, what, what was it about your collaboration with him that, that that was so special? Well, it was completely terrifying at first. I mean, we'd never met each other. Um, you know, I'm turning up. He turned up like when the crew turned up, like whenever it was six weeks or before. We'd heard, we didn't have a long prep. Um, and he was kind of physically, you know, manifesting at that time. It was like really crazy. But I don't know, just the more, obviously, you, like every relationship, you just kind of find, you're finding your feet with someone. And um, I don't I just felt that like he really worked on instinct, which is something I think I do. For Joaquin Phoenix, who came to this much later, obviously, than you or Robin Williams, who'd been immersed in it for so long, how did he prepare to be Callahan, to make himself into this guy? Um, this is the kind of question that Joaquin would like start looking at the floor, um, but I can answer for him. Um, <laughs> let's see, he um, he is sort of he does. I think even when he read the book, he's probably already thinking about you know the possibilities. So he's getting inspired, and then um, as he gets closer, I mean, he had a book that was marked in like four different colors and like written things written in the margins and extra pages pasted in that he lost on the set one day um which was shocking because so much stuff was in it i thought oh can he can continue to work without this bible that he had created so he's spending enough time to actually create this crazy looking version of the book Does um steal it, do you think? no he, he found it i forgot it was oh. probably in a car or something like that but um we did find it um, it's a very Callahan kind of thing to do. Yeah, and he he um, did have me go through every page of the book with him, and we would talk um, for about ten minutes or more, or fifteen minutes, about on each page, or sometimes longer. And I think that took about two weeks. So it was like him making sure that what he was going to do was going to fit into what you wanted to be happening. And he wanted to like hear it very clearly, like what was supposed to be happening in each scene. So he knew the parameters of where he should go. I always have to write it with an actor in mind. It really just helps fuel the writing. So I really specifically wrote for Joaquin Phoenix. What I like about Joaquin is his unpredictability. He's playing jazz while other people are doing math. He's just doing his own thing. <laughs> And I feel like that's very much what we saw the character of Arthur slash Joker as. And I just thought, boy, if we get him, we could really um, do something special. We never rehearsed the character. We never talked really specifically about what he would do. All we really talked about was script and story and character. But we never talked about how are you going to do it, you know what I mean? I think his process is one of surprise for himself. We've been editing this movie for so long because there's 18 trillion versions of this movie just based on the way he would do things so differently every time. You would come over to him and give him one line of direction and it would literally change everything in a great way. And he was just never locked into one thing. 